So our next speaker is Dr. Mary Brunette, who's an associate professor in psychiatry uh, here at the uh, Geisel Medical School. And Mary's been a pioneer in considering the um, last holdout group, really, for, um, can for tobacco cessation. As many of you know, the rate of uh, tobacco use has gone uh, way down in the general public, but has not gone down at all among people who have uh, serious mental illness. Uh, and Mary has uh, done a serious job of tackling this problem and trying to figure out how to uh, get these folks uh, into evidence-based treatments. So, join me in welcoming Mary. All right, now you're going to see how technology challenged I am. There we go. So, up here, there we go, thanks. Great. And just to remind you, we want to just click on the okay. there. So I escape and then I do that? Yep. Okay. Okay, can people hear me okay? All right, great. All right, so as Bob said, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to talk about this online motivational decision support system that um, we developed at Dartmouth. Joelle Farron was the lead uh, who initiated this work, and I joined her, and a whole host of people have helped us. Um, you can see this long list, and there are many others. Um, the work that I'm going to present today has been supported by the West Family Foundation, Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation, National Cancer Institute. Lisa's uh, NIDA Center, and I think that's it. Okay, so my goal today is to identify advantages for using technology in smoking cessation treatment efforts and to talk about strategies of adapting technology to be useful for disadvantaged populations. So not everybody um, is attending college at Dartmouth. There's other people out there who may be a little different, and I'll, I'll expand on that. So I'm going to talk about tobacco. Um, the picture on the left is a Persian woman who's smoking tobacco from a hookah about 2,000 years ago. So tobacco's been around for a long time, and people figured out how to enjoy it a long time ago. The picture on the right is familiar to everyone, I'm sure. It's the Marlboro Man from an advertisement. I think that was in the 80s. He looks fairly contemporary. Um, smoking, or tobacco, in the Western world, was actually used through chew and cigars until the 20th century when smoking cigarettes became popular. And this is data that shows the use of cigarettes. Let's see if I can <clears throat> work this thing. So there's 1910. Here's white men. It, smoking peaked around 1950. Guess what happened in 1950? Anybody know? Yes? Yes. And what did the Surgeon General's report say? Smoking causes cancer. So a massive public health campaign began, and look what happened to the prevalence of smoking among educated white men. Went down. Educated white women, down. What about uneducated people? Not so much. Uneducated women. It keeps going up. That's the women's movement. So it turns out the public health campaign worked for privileged, educated people, but it didn't work for those who have disadvantages of low income, low educational level. Okay? And it didn't work for another very large group of people, people who have mental illness and or people who have addictions to alcohol and drugs. So here's data from a national survey that happened in the US in the 90s. At that time, among people, there we go, without mental illness, about 40% said they had smoked at some time in their life. And almost half, the darker blue bar, said they had quit smoking. That left a current prevalence of smoking around 25% at that time. But what if you have depression? 
What if you have anxiety disorder? The rates of ever having smoked are a lot higher, and the rates of quitting are lower. What, do you ha what if you have a severe mental illness? What if you have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? Or what if you're addicted to cocaine? The rates are even higher, and the quit rates are even lower. Okay, So you can see this is another really important uh, disparity group. P these are people who are still smoking. In a more recent national survey, those without mental illness, 18% were smoking. Those with mental illness, 30 to 60%, with the same kind of range here. If you have a severe mental illness, you're around 60%. Um, otherwise, you're around 30%. That's a lot of people. Um, a recent report said that they felt, they did a calculation and felt that people with mental illness or addiction smoked almost half of the cigarettes that are consumed in our country. And we're just, as a treatment community and as a public health organization, we're not making inroads. We're not helping this group quit. Here's people with schizophrenia from 99 to 2011. The rates are flat. People aren't quitting. They're, the prevalence of smoking is staying the same. Here's bipolar disorder. In this study, it looks like it's actually going up. That's a... That's not good. Here's the general population, people without mental illness, it's actually going down. So even up to the current time, this is happening. We're, we're not making progress as we should be. So why do we care? Well, let's, for me, this is kind of personal. So this is a picture of a guy called Ted, who I worked with. I worked at Manchester Mental Health for many years in the 90s, and I worked with a lot of people who had severe mental illness. And um, during that time, you know, we asked people about smoking, and we talked with them, but we didn't necessarily do much. So, so this was a guy who was probably in his late 30s. He had gotten ill when he was a teenager, really struggled with schizophrenia for a while, was in and out of the hospital, um, smoked a lot of pot, did drugs. But he got his illnesses under control. So by the time I met with him, when he was about 38, he was doing pretty well. He was um, volunteering, saw his mother every week who lived in town. He had a girlfriend that he enjoyed being with. Um, but he still smoked cigarettes, a couple packs a day. So I asked him about it. I advised him to quit. I offered him cessation treatment. He said, no, thank you, ma'am. And I let it go, which is what we did at that time. Since that time, reports like this have come out showing increased early mortality in this group by 30 years. So all of you can expect to live to about 80. If you're in this group of people with severe mental illness, you can expect to live to about 50. Well, OK, those are statistics. Fine. Back to Ted. So I worked with him for about five years, and then I left that job. I took a job working at the Department of Health and Human Services in New Hampshire. So I'm the medical director for the Bureau of Behavioral Health. And one of my, the pieces of my job is that I review all the deaths that happen in our mental health system. And about five years ago, among one of the papers shoveling across my desk was Ted. Hadn't showed up for an appointment. Case manager called, no answer. Mother doesn't know where he is. They go to the home, knock on the door, no answer. They finally call the police to do a wellness check. They break into the apartment, and Ted is found dead on the floor. Died of a heart attack, age 51. So smoking causes heart disease, and that is the major killer of this group of people. This is something that's preventable. Smoking is the most the most common cause of death that's preventable in the US, and it's killing the people that we know and love. So we need to do something about this. So we've been thinking, well, what could we do about this? There's a variety of strategies we could take in working on smoking. You can take the overall view and look at the environment and policy. One of the, you know, we tax tobacco, we raise the price, and that inhibits young people from starting to smoke. It's effective. We could train clinicians how to do a better job of treating people. 
we can work on our treatments. We actually have pretty good treatments that are effective for helping people quit smoking, but you could argue that they could be made better. Or you can work with the patient or the person who smokes. And this is the strategy we decided to take. At Dartmouth, we're really working on developing patient decision support systems to help people be more involved in their treatment, to help them be engaged in their treatment. So this is the track we wanted to take. Um, we wanted to build on that experience at Dartmouth. Because we do have good treatments, this is just an example of some data uh, for smoking cessation in people who have schizophrenia. Whoopsie. You can see here, you know, people who use treatment, over half of them were able to quit smoking. That's a very substantial outcome, much better than the control treatment. So treatments dramatically improve um, people's ability to quit, but they just don't use treatment. We've done a lot of qualitative work. Um, generally, people with mental illness and or addiction just have a lot of misinformation about cessation treatment, a lot of attitudes that um, inhibit their ability to participate in that. So what do you do? Well, there's a kind of counseling called motivational interviewing. That's a style of counseling designed to engage people in a health behavior change, in this case, smoking cessation or using cessation treatment. Um, that's been studied for people with mental illness. Um, some of my colleagues have done this and shown, yeah, you can get people engaged with a single session, kind of like Tracy's work that uh, you just saw. Um, the problem is that our mental health clinics, our addiction clinics, people are super busy, they don't know how to do this style of counseling, and it just doesn't happen. So rather than embarking on, you know, working on clinicians, we decided to take the patient-focused approach and we thought, let's, can we use technology? Can we use technology as a, as a tool to help us uh, deliver this kind of intervention? Lisa Marsh talked early this morning about how technology can really expand the reach of an intervention. Here's some data that exemplifies that. This is data from Minnesota where they had a statewide tobacco control program that included some in-person treatments, a telephone treatment, and a web-based treatment. And you can see that this website is the purple line. This is how many people were reached by the intervention. Ten times more people were able to use treatment by using the website compared to these in-person interventions. So it dramatically expands the reach. And in doing so, reduces the cost. Look at the cost per quit here. It's just minuscule compared to in-person treatment. And it delivers treatment the same way every time. Lisa mentioned that. You can ensure quality of treatment by delivering it with electronic tools. So we thought, we saw this and I thought, I went into Joelle's office one day and I said, well, maybe there's a website we can use. So we got out the laptop, she typed in to Google, quit smoking. And these are the four websites that came up first. Becomeanx.org is a website made by a private foundation that wants to help people quit. PMUSA, that's Philip Morris's website. Phyllis Morris is a tobacco company. They have a website to help people quit, isn't that nice? They, um, as part of the settlement agreement, they were required by law to help people quit smoking, which I have to say I still find quite ironic. They're selling the tobacco to get you addicted and then they're gonna help you quit. Anyway, so that's one of the other websites. Smokefree.gov is the National Cancer Institute's website designed to help people quit, and Why Quit is another private foundation website. We thought, this is a nice array of websites. Let's test them out, let's see if they're good. Let's see if they could work for people with schizophrenia, people with addictions. So we uh, got a panel of experts. We developed a comprehensive checklist that looked for content and usability based on recommendations uh, for people with disabilities. And we had experts go through these four websites. Which one do you think was the winner? Somebody says Philip Morris. I'm happy to say that's not true, <laughs> although they were not bad. What other one do you think won? National Cancer Institute. They really had the best website. Um, it still wasn't scored super high, but it scored the highest. Philip Morris was okay with usability, but that website contained misinformation. So it flunked because it was providing misinformation, okay? So we felt 
uh, based on our assessment that none of these was really that great from the expert review point, but we thought let's have our user group test them. So we invited people with severe mental illness to try these websites out. We gave them two specific tasks to try. One was um, find information that will help you cope while you're quitting. Number two was find information about Chantix, a quit medication. We had them sit down with these programs and try them, and here's what we found. Philip Morris's website was the easiest to use. National Cancer Institute website, people could not use it. Um, so based on that, we felt there isn't something out there that's really um, going to work well for people with severe mental illness. We think we need to develop our own. So that's what we did. We wanted our website to motivate people to quit smoking and to motivate them to use effective cessation treatment and to give them information about cessation treatment. We wanted the website to be wake welcoming to all racial and ethnic groups, and we wanted the website to be usable by um, disadvantaged populations who may have cognitive impairments, may have low reading ability, maybe they can't even read at all, um, and so on. And people who don't really know how to use a computer, we wanted it to be usable really by everyone, all smokers anyway. So Joelle Farron took the lead on um, building this out and doing a lot of user testing. So I, many people this morning have said it, I'm going to say it again, it's really important, whatever technology-based tool you're developing, you want to make sure your end users are involved in the development along the way. That's the only way to ensure that your tool is going to be appealing to them and usable by them. Um, so you can see here's a picture of uh, one of our users giving us feedback on these tools. So what we ended up doing was um, building in some instructions for how to use the tool in it. So if you aren't very familiar with a computer and you get on this, you can click and get information on how to use a computer mouse. There are a lot of explicit instructions within it telling you what to do. We also settled on a very simple linear design. So in this website you get on and it's like you're getting on a train, you're going to go forward to the end. It's as opposed to being at a central hub and being able to go any, whoops, in any direction, you're going to start and go in one direction. And that keeps people from getting lost. It's also only two layers deep, also to prevent people from getting lost. If you want more information, you can go deeper and get more information, and then it always brings you back to where you started, so you don't get lost. We use large buttons and font. Um, this group may have dexterity problems, may have um, difficulty reading and seeing. Um, we use a lot of explicit instructions. Uh, we don't rely on abstraction. We don't rely on working memory. We try to make everything really explicit. You look at the page and you, it tells you what to do. We also keep the language at fifth grade level and we use text-to-speech software. So the program is read to you if you choose to have it read to you. So you don't need to read it all to use this program. The content from the program is based on the theory of planned behavior. The idea here is we address attitudes about smoking and cessation treatment, social norms, and perceived behavioral control, as those all impact change in smoking behavior. We use video hosts of people like me, so we have a person with mental illness um, engaging the user in the program and guiding them through the program. We have uh, quit stories, people who um, have mental illness who quit, talking about using treatment and how it worked for them. Um, all of this was guided by focus groups and user testing. We also use functionality to enhance engagement um, for people who have uh, difficulty concentrating, paying attention, difficulty remembering. The more you can keep them engaged in every single page, the more they're able to pay attention and then remember what they're learning in the program, so it's interactive. People put in information and get information back that's synthesized, and they get reports uh, about what they put in. So we use this kind of process to develop this web-based decision support system that's designed to get, engage people in evidence-based treatment. We also found that there's a lack of access and ability to find good behavioral treatment once you want to quit. So we've start, started building out a cessation treatment website and we're working on 
um, a cell phone app that's designed to be with a person and, and provide in the moment support for cessation. And the design is all really simple. So this is an example of a page from our website. Looks kind of boring, doesn't it? Well, any time you make it more complicated, people would get confused. So if you see here, uh, there's our logo, and there's no other confusing information being presented. There's no ads, there's no blinking lights, there's no moving parts. We're talking about one simple concept on this page. We're not trying to do two or three or four concepts. We're keeping it to one. And there's one function to the page. We're not trying to do multiple functions. Look at how big the buttons are. That's so you can get that arrow on there to click. Look at the explicit instruction of what that button is about. You're going to click if you want to know more. OK. So how are we doing for time? I think I have time. I think what I'm going to do is actually get on the website and show you a little bit about how it looks, because I think we have enough time. So let's see if I can make it happen. Escape. All right. So this is our um, landing page. There's explicit instructions on the site explaining what it is and what to do. And there's three big buttons of the different, three different sections for the site. And there's automatic text-to-speech. And let's see if I can make it work. I've mute, we muted this, and I don't know if I'm unmuting it. Let's see what happens here. So, you're seeing um, an administrative version of this so that I can jump through it. So normally, a user wouldn't see this, but I, this allows me to scroll through the website and jump around. And I can see that it's in the middle of it. Um, so, in, so I'll just explain this section of the program to you. So the user would see this. Um, in parts of the section, if people want more information, they can get information from a doctor. It allows them to choose a doctor. We try to provide um, a variety of people that they could hear from. So if you click on one of these, you'll get information from them later when you say you want more information. We, um, if I show you a video later, you'll see the video we actually stream through this is fairly low quality, and we do that so that at a mental health center or an addiction treatment center or a federally qualified health clinic where we're using this, um, they don't have good uh, quality computers. They don't have high quality internet connection. So if you try to stream really high quality stuff, it gets mucked up. They don't have the capacity for that. So we um, use lower quality stuff that um, will go through. So here's some basic information. Um, the person has it. Let's see if it's going to. A little more information. Nicotine addiction and withdrawal. When you cut down or stop smoking, you feel grumpy or nervous and you crave tobacco. This is called withdrawal. Counseling, nicotine replacement therapy, and other medications can reduce withdrawal. You can watch a video of a doctor talking about tobacco if you want to know more. Click on one of the answer boxes below. Want to know? So I want to know more. Yeah. All right. Well, you get a sense of what it looks like. And so you can see the importance of <laughs> your content and making it work with the, um, the internet that your user site has. So we would, when we, are, we designed this program to be, you talked earlier today about standalone that are going to be direct to consumer. We talked about uh, tools that could be used in a clinic um, that might be a clinician extender or a tool that could be used in a clinic that might replace, be a clinician replacer. We designed this to replace a clinician to do a motivational intervention and to provide decision support. But for it to happen within a clinic where you could have it be on a computer in that office, in a, in a room where the, a doctor or a clinician could prescribe this, and, and invite all smokers to get education about smoking and to use it in that setting. All right. 
So I'm going to go back to the program here and my slides. Oh, I'm a Mac user and this is not. And now where is slideshow? There it is. F5. Now I gotta get get you there. Okay. So just wanna remind you, this is what a standard website looks like. Look how different that is. How how much cognitive effort it's gonna take to navigate this and read this compared to that. So for a disadvantaged population, you know, this is a lot more accessible, okay? So, so just another example. So this is the page that's talking about triggers on this standard website. Here's a page talking about tri triggers on our website. Really simple, really clear, large buttons, one concept, okay? So we, we've studied it, we've, we've piloted our website. Um, we've taken it to several different mental health clinics. This was our first pilot, you can see, um, Overall, those who used the website, over 40% initiated evidence-based cessation treatment compared to about 15% of our control group who were given a public health pamphlet. We did another larger pilot study in 140 people. We replicated our finding, about 36% of our folks initiated cessation treatment among uh, the group, almost a third actually got at least a week of abstinence, which was great. We did an analysis where we would, tried to predict what helped people get abstinent. And we wanted to know, did our, you know, did our program work for just people who had depression over those with schizophrenia? Did it matter how addicted you were to cigarettes? Did it matter how, what level of psychiatric symptoms you had or what your level of impairment was? And the Hi, only thing that my name is Dr. Eric Hudson. That was the doctor we were waiting for. <laughs> I'm never showing my website at a talk again. <laughs> oh, God. So we wanted to know what predicted whether people could actually get abstinent. We wanted to know if the website worked for, for all comers. And what we found was that the only thing that predicted abstinence was using cessation treatment. So whether or not you had, whether you were old or young, whether you had schizophrenia or a different mental illness, whether you had high symptoms or low symptoms, whatever your reading ability, none of that predicted abstinence. So we interpret that to mean this seems to be usable and effective for a range of people with serious mental illness disability, okay? So, so, so that was um, helpful. The one thing that did predict whether you got abstinent was after you got through the program, if you said, yeah, I want to try to quit, that predicted whether you got abstinent. We did find that people who had schizophrenia, people who were older, and people who had lower cognition took more time in the program. So they compensated by just taking more time to go through the material and connect with the material. We thought, well, this seems to look pretty good in mental health clinics. What about federally qualified health clinics where a lot of disadvantaged people get care um, and a lot of those people are smokers? We replicated our finding there. It seemed to look very similar. Um, among the users of the program here, almost 50% initiated cessation treatment. We also tried it out in a small group of pregnant women. We built out some content focused on um, pregnant smokers to see if we could engage them. Um, we didn't have as good of luck with our pregnant smokers. 11% engaged in treatment. But why do you think that is? What is evidence-based treatment for smoking cessation for pregnant women? There's not a lot of options. It's basically counseling. Medication options don't work for pregnant women or they're not safe. So there's not as many options to choose from. This, these were our abstinence outcomes in this federally qualified clinic. We did see that, oh, by the way, the green is, this is our control group. That's the number of people who use cessation treatment in our control group. 
among the people who used the program, those who got abstinent were a lot higher than our control group as well. So it looks promising for a variety of disadvantaged smokers. And we're, we're studying it in a randomized controlled trial right now. All right, so in summary, people with mental illness and other disadvantaged groups are at high risk for smoking, and consequently they have disparate health outcomes. Technology seems to be an effective way to deliver tobacco treatments to them, but we really need to adapt and modify the structure of these uh, treatments when we are serving disadvantaged groups. Thanks very much.